Um, this is a using open source tools to improve digital um, processing workflows presentation, part of the open source um, I'm Rachel Curtis. Uh, this is my colleague, Laura Davis. Uh, we are both digital project specialists at the Library of Congress. Um, and though our titles are the same, um, we do different work. Um, so we're going to kind of go through our workflows, how we use open source tools um, in our daily work. Um, and we will get started here. Um, so like I said, I, I'm Rachel Griggs. Um, I am the project coordinator for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. So I manage all of the recorded sound and moving image files that come to the library through the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Um, and it's, it's, it's very similar to a community-based acquisition process um, for the library, and it's not really something the library had undertaken um, previous to this project um, uh, start. <coughs> um, so I'll give an overview of um, what I've done to handle the digital material coming into um, our section, um, how I manage it, and some of the challenges and open source tools that I found useful um, for my project. Um, so my first thing is that I'm going to sort of start at the beginning before um, the library had hired either Laura or myself. Um, and sort of how the library was handling um, digital uh, material. And it was kind of the Wild West. So um, hard drives that came in um, either through copyright deposit or just sent to the library with content from gifts um, were usually shelved. Um, sometimes um, cataloged as items themselves and just set aside for later processing. Um, files that came in um, were stored in a server space, uh, we call embargo, but is very similar to basically a digital closet. Um, and items are difficult to pull down from that. It, it's, it's a storage space, basically. Um, there was no one person on staff um, dedicated to doing born digital ingest. Um, it was kind of different people as needed. Um, files were ingested on an as needed basis. There was no coordination between staff. There was no workflow documentation. Um, and there was a pretty big digital backlog. Um, as larger batches of files started to arrive with contractual obligations like the American Archive, um, it became very obvious that um, dedicated staff members were needed to manage this content, process them in a, in a timely manner, and create documentation. Um, and then when I was hired, um, about three years ago, there was already um, plans in motion to hire two more digital project archivists, um, Laura and then Keith Paramore, who is um, who works with recorded specifically with recorded sound material. Um, so there were two projects, sort of, well, sort of three things that sort of was the catalyst um, for this. Um, like the lovely picture of how we were receiving hard drives. So there was an increasing backlog of material, which is more, is more Laura's purview, so she's going to get into that. Um, there was the History Makers Project and the American Archive. Um, so the History Makers Project, I mentioned this here because um, a lot of the processes put in place for um, ingesting that content were duplicated for the initial um, ingestion of the American Archive files. Um, there were contractual obligations, so files had to be processed in a timely manner. Um, workflows had to be developed for our systems, which our internal library systems are really geared toward ingesting material um, digitized in our labs from library content that already had a database record for them. History Makers and American Archive are files coming from without our institution and just as digital files. We don't have any, we have to create the metadata records for them and sort of plan an ingest path um, for them. Um, a lot of work when I started uh, was falling on our video lab supervisor, and it wasn't something he could be dedicated. He had other responsibilities. He had to come. So I was hired to um, Lauren Sorensen was my um, predecessor, and then I came on um, after she left to sort of take up this project. Um, so the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, which I'm sure a lot of you here have heard of, um, it was a corporation of public broadcasting um, funded. Um, project and that later WGBH and the Library of Congress um, took on. Um, so it initially funded a two-year position um, at the library to coordinate the arrival of the 70,000 initial preservation files. Um, Lauren's work was focused on metadata mapping, um, pulling records down 
from WGBH's um, archival management system into our Mavis database, um, putting in place technical specifications um, with the input of James Snyder. Um, and then there were all, when I started, there were already grants in place for um, the American Masters Digitization Project, News Hour, and the NET Cataloging Project. Um, and then when I, I came on, um, I was really tasked with dealing with some of the outlying issues with that initial ingestion of preservation files, and then dealing with the new grant projects that were going to be coming. <coughs> um, so I briefly touched on the library's role in the American Archive. It's really on long-term preservation. Um, we do provide on-site access to the material digitized um, through this. Um, we have joint policy decisions and governance with WGBH for this project. And um, now that we've finished our NAT cataloging project um, and have a better handle on that material, we're doing in-house digitization and sending files um, to the American Archive um, for access um, online, which is great. And so when I started, it was quickly obvious that, um, well, there was no documentation of any of the workflows. So that was one of my first tasks. And um, I also um, recognized like some of our in-house um, proprietary software was not sufficient to, um, to just handle this project. So I started advocating um, for more open source tools to be um, adapted or accepted um, by the library officially um, for us to work through these challenges. Um, so some of my challenges when I initially started were these um, large digitization grants that were in place, um, except for NET, that was a cataloging project. Um, so anything digitized, usually from analog material that um, the that, uh, uh, institution wants to add to the American Archive, usually needs grant funding. Um, so American Masters, um, recently uh, Riverside Church received a clear grant, um, Peabody, PBS NewsHour, and these are large projects. These are anywhere from 4,000 to, in news hour, 8,000 um, uh, assets being digitized and files that need to be managed as they come into the archive. And these projects take a lot of time from managing um, just the administrative things to, um, uh, it's about two years, and then to ingest the actual preservation files. Um, in addition to that, uh, a lot of stuff is coming from multiple sources, um, both from small institutions, small local institutions, to larger national institutions, all of which um, staff has a varying degree of um, either inventories of what they have, um, technical expertise. Um, no one institution is the same, so um, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag um, as uh, we work with people to give them as much help because um, we really want their stuff um, and, and to work with them um, to get their preservation files. Um, we also get a variety of file formats, so this is just kind of an example of, based on projects that we've already adjusted and that are um, in the works, um, just a whole range of stuff. Um, the libraries, uh, our preservation standard is the JPEG 2000, um, but we also get uncompressed files, QuickTime, MKB, <coughs> ProRes, MPEG files, AVI, DMX, HD, just a whole range, um, especially when it comes to born digital content, we're getting what they have is what we get. So um, that is also another challenge. Um, and then making the case for open source tools. Um, the library, for a variety of reasons, um, and, and there is a long bureaucratic process too, to, um, uh, to make the case that it should accept open source tools despite maybe some of the security risks or um, just make the library more comfortable in making these uh, official, officially tools that we can work with. Um, so some, uh, some things I used to make the case are we're able to manage projects with more agility, um, work collaborati collaboratively across multiple institutions, keep track of project progress, especially when it involves multiple institutions, um, multiple, managing multiple file formats, and managing inconsistent metadata. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of case studies, um, mainly the NewsHour project, which was a grant funding project, um, which we had, um, because it was a grant, we had a little more control over what the files were that we were going to receive, how we were receiving them, and the timeline. And then also, um, my second case study is working with smaller institutions, where um, it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, um, and it's a little more um, 
time intensive in some cases to keep track of all the stuff that's coming in from the smaller institutions. Um, so for news hour, um, this, like I said, this was a project to digitize um, analog content. Um, WN, uh, let's see, WIDA and um, let's see, NARA held the tapes um, from NewsHour that spanned a whole range of file formats. Um, and the preservation files came to the Library of Congress, access files went to WGBH, and also preservation files also went to NewsHour. So this was a uh, clear funded um, grant um, that ran over two, two and a half years, I think, Casey, yeah. So um, we've recently just finished, pretty, we're just wrapping up this project, um, which was, has been very successful, um, but really um, kind of was my first project that I took on when I started and to make the case that I really needed some open source tools. Um, so like I said, over 8,000 takes were digitized, a whole range of formats, stored in three different locations, um, and then the library agreed to digitize about 570 outstanding tapes um, from this project. Um, there were some inventory issues, so um, WGBH hired a contractor to perform an item level inventory, weed out um, any duplicates, and that step was really necessary because, um, as I said, our system, we needed the metadata in place in order to accept any sort of files into our system. Um, and my first task was to get us to um, accept open refine because I really needed that to normalize the data. Um, otherwise, it was going to be a lot harder for me to create um, uh, uh, batch records. Um, so then as I'm going through and planning with my team um, to ingest these files, we really built on the lessons that were learned during the initial um, CPB funded digitization of 40,000 hours. Um, initially, file delivery had been LTO tape. We decided to shift to hard drive. That was easier to manage because I didn't have access to our LTO tape drives. Um, but I didn't have access to computers that would uh, allow, you, allow me to offload hard drives. Um, we needed to do metadata cleanup and normalization, which open or fine was really necessary to that step. And then for the metadata ingestion, we needed to do um, a bunch of batch updates to our database. Um, we had initially been using XSLT for that um, initial CPD project. We switched to Python, which was a little easier for me to wrap my head around. Um, and actually, um, uh, the scripts I found were uh, more manageable <laughs> to do. And that just allows me to do batch updates into our system very easily. Um, we refined the ingest process, so I collaborated with staff at the library to set up automated workflows, and that's going to be a theme both Laura and I are going to touch on, to automate as much of this as possible, um, and, because that just makes it far more efficient, <laughs> um, and to take a lot of the manual work out of it. And then we also added a quality control component. Um, we requested a pilot batch from the vendor to confirm the quality, and then we had monthly deliveries. So the initial ingestion of 40,000 hours arrived as one big batch to the library on LTO tapes with no mechanism really in place to say, I'm sorry, this file, we can't read this file, there's something wrong with it, we need a new copy. There wasn't really that process in place. So with NewsHour, we really needed that in there so we could go back to the vendor and say, Please redigitize this tape or rewrap this file. There was something wrong with us, wrong with it, delivering a copy. Um, and then um, we used Google Docs to track um, issues across all three institutions WGBH, NewsHour, and ourselves, both in the preservation and proxy files, um, to track any issues. Um, WGBH was also um, tracking missing dates as well um, for episodes that were missing. Um, so the library received um, baked items. Again, this is something um, we can um, request this from vendors, but we very, uh, very rarely get files and bags from um, individual donors. Um, we got a preservation file, a QC tools report. Our own software we use for QC is called Baton. That um, report was added to the ingest package. We get, got SRT files with closed captioning when it was available, and then checksums as well. So we had a whole, um, the only manual part of this process was really um, some of the metadata and um, checking the files that failed QC. Those had to be manually checked 
uh, really kind of tested the limits of our automated QC. Um, and we found that most errors, um, there were a few we had to send back to the vendor, but most of them were not actually the errors that the software was, was flagging. Um, so uh, those just had to be manually put back into the automated process. But otherwise, um, I really relied on <coughs> staff that was, I was becoming more familiar with Python, um, but there was other on staff who were even more familiar with it, so we were um, getting this automated process set up. Um, and then there's just the last 570 tapes that we're digitizing that goes through our normal work workflows um, as part of this project. Um, so here's kind of my open source toolkit for this project. Um, Media Info is part of our automated um, scripts to check the files um, and sort of troubleshoot any errors that might occur. Um, there are actually very few of them. Um, open Refine to deal with the metadata. Um, Confluence we used internally um, to, um, all my documentation is stored on there, so <coughs> if for some reason I was hit by a bus the next day, someone would be able to take over my project and um, continue on the ingestion. Python was again key for our automation process and Google Docs for keeping track of issues um, that occurred across the whole project. Um, so that was kind of the news hour project. So in contrast to that, um, we, manage, we also get born digital donations from um, individual stations and producers. Um, and like I said, sometimes this is a bit more time intensive. We really can't, we can't put really any demands on what we receive. Um, when, we, uh, when a station contacts us or we contact them, we ask them what they have, what sort of collections um, are there, but again, what they have is, is what we get. Um, and this is just sort of a screenshot of a modified, um, an example of what a Trello page that we sort of used to manage these looks like. Um, because we have several elements we kind of need to keep track of for this. Um, so like I said, for file acquisition from individual donors and stations, um, we do some information gathering. So what do they have? Um, are their materials analog or digital? Um, if they're analog, they're probably going to need to apply for a grant. Um, what file formats or storage media do they have? What metadata or some inventory do they have? Um, and we, we need to track all of that information because to accept this collection, we need to have it approved by both the Library of Congress and WGBH. Um, there's a deed of gift, sort of a legal process that's in place. If they are getting a grant, we're often helping them with their grant application status, with which Casey has spent much time um, helping uh, stations do. And then um, when the material arrives, when it's complete, any issues that pop up. Um, so my, this Trello, sort of, the, there's some color coding to track where the deed of gift is, where the grant application is, um, when it's sort of coming, um, in what fiscal year are we expected to receive it, because we do have a, um, a limit of 25,000 hours to accept for each year into the American Archive. Um, so Trello has been really helpful for this. I did try, I did try to do this on an Excel spreadsheet. That did not work. <laughs> um, this is much easier to track since you can uh, move the boards and cards around to where they need to be. Um, and then we also do use Google Docs, um, especially when giving um, stations and donors um, sort of the metadata templates and um, legal information and um, grant application aids. That's really been helpful. Um, the other challenge with these is that these ingests can't be easily automated um, because they're often a variety of file formats. Um, there's no checksums. Again, the files aren't big, which isn't necessarily um, a problem, but um, sometimes I get unexpected file formats, an unexpected storage device, inconsistent metadata. So there's a lot more manual tweaking that needs to happen here um, that I can't just, unlike the NewsHour project, where what I could do was upload the files into a watch folder, and then the process just picked up through the, um, the different scripts to get them ingested into our system. This one just needs a little more hand-holding. Um, so FFmpeg, Media Info, and OpenRefine are really the things I use to manage um, these sort of individual collections. Um, and there's sort of an example of just a, a graphic visual for what I'm using. But um, yeah, all of this, and Laura will go into this a little more. Um, but sort of analyzing what open source tools are available and what ones we could get um, the library's approval to use um, has really, for both of us, been just an ongoing process to make the case. So I will turn it over. So as 
Rachel mentioned, um, she and I share the same title, but we do have um, different responsibilities. Um, there's some overlap. So my, I just wanted to kind of, this is a quick way to show you where my responsibilities, what they include, um, is I do um, basic processing for gift and copyright collections for born digital collections, not digitized. Um, and part of the goal of my collection is to eliminate the, the backlog or the contents of embargo or digital closet. I love the digital closet term. Um, and that includes creating latest records, creating derivatives, um, and then ingesting the content. Um, in addition, I'm, also, um, I'm responsible for minimizing the, um, you know, it's great to take it out, but we don't want a whole bunch more to come in. So kind of keeping up with what's coming in and then um, also minimizing the backlog and automate as much as possible. Um, I also support the addition of content to our website, such as the National Screening Room and selections from the um, National Film Registry. We also have the Geographers on Film, which was a collaboration with the um, Geography and Maps Division and the Four at Home Movies, which was a collaboration with the Manuscript Division. And with that, um, I compile all of our content, the moving image files, the still, um, the still images, and the metadata, and compile all of that, and then send it to the team up in DC. Um, we're based in Culpeper, Virginia, um, to send it to the teams in DC to add it to our website. I also manage um, the creation of our um, IDR, we do register IDR values, and, um, and I also manage handle creation as well. So um, here's some of the selected collections. I don't know how many of you have the bin of drives. <laughs> um, that's an example of um, some of the drives that I have. Um, I came in and there are just boxes of drives, um, DCPs. Um, even, you know, like the receiver for your wireless mouse, did you know that, that they have hard drives that size? They have little flash drives that are that size. And those are received through copyright, and then we do have some things that are received um, gift collections that are also on hard drives. I also work with video games, but we're not going to talk about that today. Everyone loves to talk about video games, self included. But so um, across all of this, this chart is accurate of about three weeks ago, and at that point, um, I still had I think it was about 30 drives left to look at. Since then, I've gotten about 10 more. Um, so. Talking about 117, notice it's not on moving image because we do get accompanying documentation with some of these. Um, and font files, that's great. So if we just go to moving image files, this is us eight formats. This um, <coughs> big red area, why do I have to point? I shouldn't point, you can see it. This is, um, we have a preservation copy of the Vanderbilt Television News Archive, so, you, so I can blame them for that. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, so this is this is what this is what we have, um, and these are the things that I'm working on. So we talked about workflows, and one of the things that's really important, especially when you're dealing with collections that can contain one title, you know, one digital object or many digital objects that are all related, is setting project goals. And we do have. Um, my colleague Keith Paramore in Recorded Sound and I set up a whole series where we do have um, project documentation. We start with a project charter, then we have a project plan, and then we document as we go forward so that we have records of what we do. And this has been really helpful um, in terms of starting our project so everyone knows where we're going, what's happening, what changes may come across, and especially good for um, communicating with stakeholders and um, supervision. So for example, this one um, is really simple. We have our administrative information, um, the project background, what it is about the collection, um, details, and then the project requirements, which are the goals. And there's some common goals to most of the projects. Create a MAPIS record, create a derivative, ingest. And some of these other projects have additional components as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, once the goals have been um, established and approved, then we can look at available resources in order to complete the project. 
And those include, um, obviously, the skill sets that are available, because that's going to determine what tools you can use. You know, um, Rachel was talking earlier about, out in the previous session, about using XSLT. Well, that's not going to work for me unless I go out and learn more about XSLT, because I've done very little with XSLT. So, um, you know, learning your skill sets so you can apply the appropriate tools and minimize your learning curve, although we do always want continual growth. So here are some of the tools that we use. Not, of them, not all of them are um, open source. I did put a couple in Oxygen, but you could just substitute XML editor of your choice. Confluence, um, you can, for the way we use Confluence, which I'll explain a little later, you could easily substitute a Google Doc. So, um, and we'll talk about a lot of these during this session, we're not going to talk about all of them, but I just want to tell you, this is kind of our core toolkit right now, and we're always looking to add more. So today I'll be talking about three case studies, um, and they'll illustrate the planning process, including the identification of tools. This will be nice, some nice charts about um, that. And then um, discuss the processes and procedures, and then we'll discuss the successes and challenges, and then we'll open it up for questions for both Rachel and I. So the first one is Saturday Night Live. So Saturday Night Live is a preservation project for us. We receive, um, every week or so, we receive files from NBC with um, Saturday Night Live. Um, we're current up to at least right before Thanksgiving. I haven't looked to see when the last one we got is. But when I came, part of the digital closet was um, all of the Saturday Night Live episodes from 1975 to the time when I started in January of 2017. So um, by the time I got oriented and learned the tools and everything, um, we were up to over 800 episodes, many of which also have an accompanying documentation um, with scripts and cue sheets. And then the newer book, um, I think the past three or four, uh, four seasons, also include um, additional videos um, moving image files that are not only the broadcast version, they're the repeat, the dress rehearsal, and the syndication versions. So there is a lot of content here to manage, and this is the first project that I worked on um, at the institution. So the first step was to establish the workflow. You're going to see a lot of similarities during the workflow, because again, basically, create a base record, create a derivative, ingest. Okay. So with this one, we don't get any metadata with the materials from SNL. They basically just send us the files, and they'll have um, the host name in there. So um, for the 1975, you know, that big chunk of material, um, I went out and went to Wikipedia and other resources in order to get the episode information for um, the broadcast date, the guest host, the musical guest, and the cast. Okay. Then um, we're also assigning, um, we also pulled um, IDER values from um, using the API with IDER. Are, are you all familiar with IDER? It's, um, it's a DOI, the IDER Entertainment Ident Identification Registry, Identifier Registry, excuse me. Um, so, you know, we received the content. Creating the access derivative, that was pretty easy. The met metadata took a while to do. Um, we went through various iterations of a Mavis record for this. Um, I worked with my supervisor to create a template, basically, using the um, metadata off of the CSV that I had created. Um, in hindsight, I should use a database, but that's a, we'll get to that. It's learning. You're always learning. Um, and then once we had the template, then I could go ahead and batch create um, I did not do 800 at a time. Never do 800 at a time. Bad things happen. Um, it could be the most perfect thing in the world, and you will have one thing that you do not want in there. Um, and I don't say this from my own experience. I say this from the experience of others that I observe. Um, but usually we do one for all of our new automated processes. We do one. Then we'll do two. And then we may do five. And then we'll start going into like 100, which is what I was doing. I was, I'm sorry. I was doing um, five seasons at a time. So here are the tools I used for this. 
Um, I think the one, I think everyone's familiar with just about all of these except for Postman is um, an API tool um, where you can write your query and then submit it through that. Um, and then Python, it's a little PC above Python. That's a Python editor. Um, I use, I find it a little more helpful, um, especially in error resolving, um, than in idle. So here's an example of um, the PyCharm screen with, um, I put in an error, so you get this nice, the yellow boxes that will tell you, and you get the red with the fatal errors over there. Um, so again, that's really helpful when you're creating new scripts. So going back, and, um, and in VLC, you'll see that a lot. I use that for troubleshooting in case um, we do get some files that are truncated or have or damaged um, because we don't receive text messages with, them either, with these files. So if they're damaged, I will go through and use um, VLC just to see if I get it to play. And sometimes I'll pull it back, try to pull it back from embargo again, play, try to play it again, and then it goes on my list of things that don't play that we have to go back to our own demo about. So here's the workflow with the tools. Um, yeah, we use a lot of Python. <laughs> this is not a fully automated process, okay? So um, all of our automated processes are done with Python. The Open Refine and the Postman down here under the episode level metadata. Um, the Open Refine we use when pulling back the list from embargo because it's a rich text file. So I do that in part and then um, kind of create um, a more manageable CSV um, using Open Refine. Um, FFmpeg and media info. Um, and, uh, so case study number two, the um, US Senate for recordings. We built off of the um, processes that we did in the Saturday Night Live. And the key um, with this one, project goals. Okay, current backlog, I should have put dates there and I did not. And that was 2015 to January 30th of this year. Um, and then <clears throat> current receipts, which is January 31st of this year to the present. And then we've got content from 2007 to 2015 coming at some point. Um, we're creating, and for all of these, we create documentation. Again, automate as much as possible. And then um, we're always looking to apply processes to, you know, from previous projects into new projects. So again, we have this. The key difference between this and, um, the two key differences between this and, okay, three, sorry. Um, between this and Saturday Night Live is that one of the Senate gives us metadata and that has made all the difference in the world. Two, um, we, and because of that, we've been able to fully automate this process. So we receive the files that are transferred from the Senate to us, from the Senate Recording Studio, and they're placed in a watch folder. Uh, MySQL database picks it up, inventories the content, or the, the Python program picks it up, inventories the content in the database, and then the derivative creation starts, and then the Mavis, rec and then the, um, Mavis record is populated with the um, ingest package. So it's all one thing, and then it just goes in ingest. The last part, the handle, regist um, handle registration, that is not automated. That's the one part of this process that is not automated. And that's due to the um, letter of Congress handle tool that we use. I cannot automate that. I can do batches. Um, but generally, I just come in every day that we have. I get notifications when we get content from the Senate. Um, and I look and see when they're done. And once it's done, I go and create a handle. So that's just part of my daily activity. So that's an activity thing. Here's a sample of the metadata that we get, and specifically the fields that we use. So we're only using five fields from a much larger XML document. Is it, um, and then here's an example of the Mavis record. It's not robust. 
um, in, in a typical cataloging way, but what we do is we do reference the, um, the Senate record, which will have more detail about what happened that day. We create the, we have the URL, um, because they do have a URL pattern. And then that's where I also put the handle in, so the handle is created there as well. And the handle is created as part of that um, whole ingest um, process. So that handle is created when, when the object is put in the database. Now for these, for the Senate, it's not like we're getting one file per day. We don't get one file, file per day, um, one moving image file. We get one moving image file per hour that the Senate is in session on the floor. So we could get one moving image file. We could get as many as, I think the most we've gotten is 24. Um, and then you get an XML file for each of those um, MXF files. So two files per hour. So that's what this is doing. So the fact that we're able to automate it, because we do get it every day, this is a really big um, efficiency for us. So again, go through the process here. These are the tools that we use. We've talked about all of those. And again, open refine was used for the backlog to look at the, the things in the embargo and pull that out. And then here's the chart. So, because even with the with the batch document with the text file that I use for the handles, I actually use a Python. I used a Python program to create that when I had um, when I was going through that 2015 to um, excuse me 2015 to 2018 content. All of this. Um, for this process, automation was really a primary goal because we knew that we were going to get, we know we're going to get this 2005 to two, um, 2007 to 2015 content. And we do estimate that that's going to be at least 14,000 files, evenly distributed between the XML and the NXF files. The third case study is the National Screening Room. We launched the National Screening Room earlier this year. Um, some of the processes for this were based off of the selections from the National Film Registry, which was launched last year. Um, here I'm not generating the Mavis record. This is a little different, so we're shifting gears a little bit. And so um, our curator selects the content. Um, he identifies the files that we're going to use. Um, some of our, um, our, my colleagues, they edit, at, um, they edit the files and do speed correction and do whatever magic it is that they do. They drop it into a watch folder where um, a Python script will pick it up and add the bumpers from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I've heard that many times. Um, and so that's where that comes in, okay? With the, um, the still image files, there's a, and we'll come, I'll, I'll show you the program I'm using for this, is um, we use F and PET to do that with a Python, it's Python and FFmpeg. Um, for the still image files, I need to create a JPEG, to the, I need to create a JPEG at the original size and then I need to create a GIF at 500 pixels wide. What we found though is that the quality of the GIF is not, um, not as good as the JPEG when we're doing that. So um, I use ArfinView, this little red cat that was on there, you'll see it on the next slide, um, to derive the GIF from that, um, those JPEGs. Then the metadata, um, our catalogers review it. And our metadata can come from two sources, either Mavis, at which point I have to pull the Mavis records out of Mavis, export it as an XML, run a Python script to create um, a file to be imported into the DM tool, um, which is an alternate source to um, import metadata into our website. Um, our website was built to repurpose ILS records. So um, the fact that not all of our material has ILS records, um, we have to have this additional methodology to get in, 
to um, have our metadata and our, and our content included on the website. Then I gather everything, I submit the files and the metadata um, for the DM tool. I have to submit it through the DM tool. If it's an ILS record, the catalogers um, edit two fields, add or edit two fields, and then <coughs> um, I alert our team in DC. So um, here's the little red cap that we use for the still images. We use Trello to manage the content. We have over 300 titles, or almost 300 titles on the film on the screening room right now. Um, and we're trying to add titles every month. Um, so there's a lot of content to manage through all of these different parts. Um, <coughs> oh, here's the Trello board. So this is part of the Trello board. All of these have already been put. Um, online and so we have every step in the Trello board and we just move the cards across but we're with um, Trello we're really taking advantage of some of the things like um, we're looking at rights information so some of the things are only streaming it's in the screening room it's only streaming it's on in the screening room it's on the film registry so we do have um, indications for that. Green is the screen room. I think yellow is the film registry. Red is screen only. And then the black, the dark color, is replacement files. We're also working to, um, for those files that were digitized 20 years ago and they're sometimes segmented, we're, we're trying to get those replaced with better um, quality scans. So here's the workflow for this. Again, for this Trello, it use a lot more because Python isn't quite as critical for this process. Um, but this is this is our workbook for this. So some of the challenges. We always have challenges when we do this. So on um, Saturday Night Live, I already mentioned missing and damaged content. So there's some things we don't have um, that we're going to go back and ask about that. Um, for the Senate, we have um, we just started getting closed caption content along with the um, for every hour. So, I um, mean, that's an XML, so we're having to retool our entire automated process right now. Um, the screening room is the process for replacing older moving image files. Again, there's a lot of those segmented or early scans. Um, it's a lot harder than I thought it would be, but I'm not familiar with our system. So it's been a learning curve for me. I've only been at the Library of Congress for just under two years. Um, so, but we are working out processes with our colleagues in DC. And then um, the repurposing of ILS metadata for the screening room um, has presented its own set of challenges. For example, we recently um, put up a whole bunch of newsreels from All American News. And um, the way that the titling was set up in the website, um, and we call it the system P1. Um, the way the titling was set up in P1 is it did not include the um, field 245 subfield N, which um, in serials will give you the date, which will also give you the date in newsreels. So instead of having the newsreel being from a specific date, we had 23 files that said all American news with no other, no other indication um, to distinguish one file from another um, just by looking at the title in the title display. So we worked with our colleagues in DC um, and they assessed what type of impact it would have on all of the content in P1 across all of the divisions of the Library of Congress. Um, they determined that it didn't seem like it was going to do too much damage, so we were able to lobby and get that um, change made and that will be applied with the next update of the National Screening Room um, in December. And for all collections, um, it's technical issues um, resulting in the non receipt of files. This is an IT issue. So anytime we have any changes in our system, um, anytime any of our partners have changes in their system, um, we always have to be careful that we're still receiving the files that we're supposed to. That we're supposed to. Um, firewalls can really get in the way sometimes. I know that's what they're designed to do, but sometimes you don't want them to be that effective. <laughs> so, um, 
then finally, and this is the part sometimes I have a hard time with, is you do the project wrap-up and evaluation. Because, you know, I'm like, okay, good. I have a lot on my plate. I'm sure we all, I mean, I know you all do too. You finally get done with the project, and you're like, yay, we're done. And then you move on to the next thing. And this is the step that's probably the most important, is going through, doing the project wrap-up, doing your final project report, and doing an evaluation. What went really well? What could have been better? Um, you know, what if you could do it again, what would you do? For me, SNL, I wouldn't have used a CSD to manage my, my metadata. I would have built a MySQL database. Okay, fair enough. But again, that's my first project. So probably a CSD was okay for my first one, that's fine. Um, and then what elements can be reused from this project for other projects? Again, no use in reinventing the wheel on this one. You know, for every collection that we do, we are creating a derivative, almost all of them. So we just use, reuse that same script. We use the same script to move our ingest packages um, because we only have, we only put like three ingest packages in our watch folder with the content at one time. So we have a mover, um, it's called mover, a mover script that will make sure that that number is kept at three or below. So when we get to the end, we can make sure everything runs so I can go home and not have to babysit all of those, all those ingest files going over. And then you're finally done. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about uh, why you didn't like using uh, CSV. Oh, it's not that I didn't like it. Um, I like CSV a lot, but considering the volume of information I have for the Saturday Night Live project with over 800 episodes to do at one time and the cast information, my spreadsheet was going into, you know, it went A through Z, AA through AZ, and A and BA to like BN. I mean, it was huge. It was absolutely huge. Because once you start putting in, um, you know, here's my here's my um, my preservation file, here's my access file, here's my um, original file name, here are all these things that we're documenting. It just kept going and going and going. And a database would have been a much more efficient way in order to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. As a, a show that's been on the air, don't they ever have to access old episodes? And did they do that before they met you and how they had that? How did they do that themselves? So um, SNL recently launched an app where you can search by cast member and by episode. They have an amazing wealth of metadata that um, I'm hoping when we have our next conversations with them that we'll be able to tap into as well, that they will be able to share that with us when they send over the, the digital files. So yeah, they have, you should check it out. You have to sign up for it, but really it is amazing, <laughs> the, the granularity that you can get to with that. There's one in the way that. Yeah, hi, thank you. That was really good walking up to the tools and everything. Um, in my work too, I'm always trying to automate as much as possible, so then you, you know, get more done. Um, so I wonder if you could talk to parts that you can't automate or that you know that you can't, and that you won't be able to. Um, so one of those is the handle tool that I already mentioned because the hand, the way that we create handles at the Library of Congress is we have a specific tool that we use, and that's based on submitting a text file. I haven't investigated too much on how much automation we can do, but considering the way it's structured, I don't think there's a way we're going to be able to do that. The other automation and the difference between Saturday Night Live and the Senate is the amount of metadata. If we had the granularity of metadata that's in the app, we could fully automate Senate Saturday Night Live if we had the host 
the date, the um, musical guest, and the cast, we could automate Saturday Night Live as well. So really, um, so far, what it looks like is our barriers for the, and these two collections are the two that we have with regular accruals, um, is we just need to be able to have those key pieces of information. And um, the metadata has really proven to be, in these two scenarios, that's, that's the big difference right there. That is the, that is the game changer. And, I, and for those who were in the session yesterday, I mentioned um, um, well-formed, persistent, you know, persistently well-formed, consistently well-formed metadata makes all the difference. And I'll just add, um, for my projects, very similar. Um, the metadata is um, is inconsistent, so there needs to be a sort of a manual analysis of what I get um, that can't really be uh, automated, um, but we kind of build off each other's processes. I'm hoping to adapt what you've done with SNL for a, a project that's going to be starting um, soon for the American Archive. Um, and then the other component, um, with the QC component I have with some of my stuff, it's still, um, it, when it gets kicked out of the system because the QC software recognizes something's gone wrong, that's still a manual process for me to, to push it back in or to go back to the vendor to say that um, something's gone wrong. So there's that added process. Right. And I should say that one thing is Saturday Night Live that I'm doing is I'm trying to automate as much as possible, even now, because I get two files at a time, maybe four every week. And I'm trying to start, I'm starting to add those automated portions now in expectation of, of moving towards that fully automated process. But for some of the complicated processes, um, we have a colleague who um, he's um, worked with our internal systems and he's familiar with Python and um, kind of knows the ins and outs. But I've also bought the reference books. Um, I've taken a couple of online classes through Library Juice um, to kind of um, learn more about SSLT, Python, um, some of the more technical things that I'm not entirely um, familiar with. But yeah, it's it's sort of a mix of self-taught, finding those who know more, um, and then like reaching out to um, yeah, someone who, who knows more than I do um, about it, and yeah, teaching myself, taking a class. So sort of a mix of everything, because I found in library school, um, I didn't learn any of this. So it was really a, a self kind of finding the resources that I needed. So I think the same, they didn't offer any of this in library school when was there because yeah. they only existed. <laughs> And I hate the fact that I can say that. Um, no, but really, the teaching yourself. Like I taught myself Postman. You know, I just played with it, and um, I had a lot of calls to IR because they wanted their password encrypted in a certain way. And I'm like, Ugh, okay, how do I? You know, so I run around to people in the building who might know more. Um, and Keith has been an amazing resource for yeah. both of us. Um, but yeah, I'm totally, you know, no real formal formal training. Yeah. We know what we need to know on the job. <laughs> I can ask another one. <laughs> um, I like the project management worksheet thing, or you know, for each project. Uh, such a good idea. Um, but helping you allocate, you know, figure out how much how many resources you need to tackle certain projects. Um, do you find that you have more projects than you can tackle? And then what do you do about that? 
the answer is yes, there are more projects that can tackle, and the, the way we negotiate that is prioritization. So I work with um, my supervisor and our colleagues to prioritize the projects. So everything has, we have kind of a, um, when I first started, we went around and, and assessed everything that was waiting in a Virgo, and then um, put a high, medium, low assignment to it, and then we're working through that. So. Um, I don't necessarily make the determination. And there, there's some things that come up that it's a, oh, we need to do this now. So everything else gets put, to, puts aside, gets put aside. And then we tackle that. And then with the American Archive, it's really a discussion with WGBH and us. To, that's why we have the 25,000 hour limit to make sure we're not taxing all of our resources. Um, and there's, there's projects that are more intensive than others. Um, and certainly doing the grant <laughs> application management is one of those things. But um, yeah, just sort of, because um, I kind of mentioned we, uh, when a donor contacts us or we contact them, we kind of just get an idea of what they have, um, and that helps inform our decision um, of can we accept this collection, um, how much uh, work to both sides need to put into um, to, to bring it into the archive. But yeah, sort of assigning priorities to things, yeah. And one thing for me is that because um, I also, for some projects, I need cataloging resources as well and my supervisor also supervises the calibers. So um, we, can, we can balance those projects according to the priorities for me and for the priorities for the cataloger and really kind of balance that out.